I'm standing here on the southern end of Cemetery Ridge near the uh, the left flank of the second corps of the Union Army and behind me it's a statue of Father William Corby who was the chaplain of the 88th New York Infantry and it's showing him uh, it's depicting a famous scene from the afternoon of July 2nd when the Union Irish Brigade one of the most famous brigades in the Union Army was sent in the battle by this point they only were about the number of a, a medium-sized regiment. They only had maybe five or six hundred men in their uh, what was once a very large brigade. They had suffered so many casualties, fought so bravely, and they. Uh, it was here that you can um, you can see he's giving absolution. And uh, if you're not Catholic, you're not familiar with that. Uh, general absolution was given to the men before they went into the battle, and uh, this scene is one of many that were depicted in the. Uh, movie Gettysburg and you can see that scene where Father Corby gives general absolution to the entire uh, Irish Brigade before they went into battle on the afternoon of July 2nd. Behind me in the distance, you can see the Pennsylvania Monument here on Cemetery Ridge. Uh, I'm standing right near the position where the Second Corps of the Union Army ended and the Third Corps of the Union Army was supposed to extend the line. Now, over this way to my rear down this road would be where Dan Sickles was supposed to be positioned with his Third Corps, all the way up to uh, Little Round Top behind me there. But he looked out this way to the west and he felt that it would be better to go that way and he thought that it was better ground and advanced his entire corps out to that position behind me and basically created a big bulge on the left flank of the lines and it created a real problem for the Union Army but what it also did was it created a uh, unexpected obstacle that slowed down Longstreet's assault which was coming from the right flank of the Confederates out of, cemetery, or out of Seminary Ridge and that actually bought some time for other units that were coming up from Maryland, from the South, the Fifth Corps, the Sixth Corps, to get into that position and kind of fill in the gaps. And though it was a big mistake on Sickles' part, it actually may have uh, worked out to the Union's advantage in the end. I'm standing in front of the monument to the 1st Minnesota Infantry, and this is a unit that I don't think gets nearly the credit that it deserves for its actions here on Cemetery Ridge on little, at uh, the Battle of Gettysburg on the second day. See, as I've mentioned already, the Third Corps was supposed to be positioned to the south of here along Cemetery Ridge, but Sickles had moved them up. When they were hit by Longstreet's assault, they were repulsed eventually, and they came breaking back through this, uh, this part of the line. And General Hancock, who commanded the Second Corps, was very near to here. And just beyond here where I'm at, uh, you can see where the trees are past the fences. There's a little brook that runs through there. And on the other side of that were two full Confederate brigades that were attacking, were coming toward this position near the center of the Union line, which was now empty and uh, threatening, being threatened to be overrun because the uh, men under Sickles were retreating. And Hancock had called for reinforcements to come from the other end of the Union line over by, um, by Culp's Hill, and they weren't here yet. And he saw these two brigades of Confederates, I don't know how many, maybe three or 4,000 men, coming this way and threatening to cut the Union line in two, right down the middle in the center of the line. And so he came and he found eight companies uh, under command of William Colville, who was the commanding officer of the, uh, the 1st Minnesota, and he ordered them to charge those three or 4,000 men who were coming across. 262 men from Minnesota. And their Colonel William Coville instantly repeated that uh, order. The men charged headlong at the Confederate brigades and held them up long enough for the reinforcements to arrive and save the Union Center. That day, at the end of that battle, 262 men went in. 47 were still fit for duty when it was over. And they still held the line, and they were here again on July 3rd when Pickett's charge came across that same field a little bit further to the north 
and they lost another 15 men, repel repulsing Pickett's charge. 83% casualties for the 1st Minnesota. It was the highest percent casualty of any unit in the Union Army during the entire Civil War, and that's a story that I think needs to be told.